Well, good, good morning or afternoon. I'm not sure when we're supposed to be. I'm uh, speaking to you from the basement of the School of Architecture in Princeton, New Jersey on Tuesday afternoon. And uh, I certainly wish I could be there, um, but uh, my travel schedule simply didn't allow it. Uh, and assuming all the technology works, at least this saves me the jet lag. Uh, I have to admit from the beginning to a bit of a sense of puzzlement over the intensity and the persistence of these recent debates around the critical and what has been called the post-critical or the projective. Puzzlement because, first of all, the current debate seems to me both all too familiar and rather belated. Uh, sorry, can we start over? Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that, that isn't the best start. i got to figure out a way to you know, just erase that and start over. Or, you know, we have two hours of time, so I can just cut okay. from... Okay. Of course, the thing about these things is probably sometimes better if you just actually don't even think about it so much. Um, so, good morning or good afternoon. I'm not sure what time it is in the Netherlands. I'm speaking to you from the School of Architecture at Princeton University on Tuesday afternoon, March uh, 14th. And I have to admit from the beginning to a bit of a sense of puzzlement over the intensity and persistent, the persistence of these recent debates around the critical and what has been called the post-critical or the projective. Puzzlement because, first of all, the current debate seems to me both all too familiar and rather belated. I really thought we covered this ground long ago. But second, because I suspect the positions held are probably irreconcilable. Call me a pessimist, but I doubt that as a result of anything said here today, Reinhold Mark is going to turn around and say, you know, you guys were right all along. Precisely what is at issue in the debate over the critical and the projective is architecture's ability to get out of its bubble and touch the world. In that sense, what worries me is that the minute the debate is taking place in the discursive space of the conference, discourse inevitably trumps practice. And I contrast that to the liveliness of the many practices out there in the world, practices that include design, urbanism, ecology, engineering, writing, curating, and scholarship, that simply no longer feel obligated to check in with the critical, not out of any antipathy to the insights and the power of critical theory, but rather out of a confident awareness that the critical has already been fully incorporated into our ways of working and thinking. So, to the degree that this conference is seen as another occasion to rehearse this old debate, I have to say I'm a bit skeptical. To the degree that it's seen as an occasion to set a new agenda around the projective, I welcome a chance to contribute. Now, to speak first to the timeliness of this debate, it's been useful to figures such as George Baird and Reinhold Martin to describe the projective as something that has emerged only in the past few years as an edible reaction to the intellectual dominance of Peter Eisenman, who was identified as the chief protagonist of criticality. But the genealogy of what, what Whiting and Sommel have identified as projective practice is longer and more complex. If I think about the evolution of my own position, as early as 1992, in a lecture at Columbia, later published in the journal D, Columbia Documents of Architecture and Theory, I called for, quoting here, a recognition of architecture's status as a fundamentally projective discipline. Architecture's potential, I wrote at the time, lies not so much in its ability to function as critique, that is to say, to interrogate existing reality from some imaginary place outside that reality, as in its ability to project alternative realities from a necessarily compromised position as a constituent part of that reality. Not new descriptions of existing realities, which would trust in architecture's analytical and mimetic capacity, but forceful propositions about future realities, which would foreground architecture's creative and affirmative capacities. Now, I wouldn't necessarily use the same language today, but I think this is still a pretty fair description of my position. I also don't want to claim that I was so much ahead of the curve. Uh, at the time, I was simply trying to articulate my own position, and on the other hand, the context of that statement, Columbia in the early 1990s, reflects debates and discussions with like-minded colleagues and friends, such as Greg Lynn, Jesse Reiser, Bob Sommel, John Reichman, Sandra Quinter, or Jeffrey Kipnis, many of whom were at that time exhibiting a similar impatience 
uh, with conventional uh, academic critical theory. Moreover, to say as I do here that the projective, this unique ability to imagine and implement alternative realities, is a property specific to architecture, suggests that in the long arc of architecture's history, it may be the critical that is the historical anomaly. Projective practice in this sense is a tautology, what architectural practice is not projective, whereas critical practice in architecture is, in my view, simply a contradiction in terms. Now, in assemblage conferences in 1994 and 1997, these issues were further aired out under, under the rubric of affirmative versus negative practices. I introduced the distinction between discursive and material practices in a paper on infrastructural urbanism at the second of those two conferences, and the issue seemed to come to a head at the Museum of Modern Arts Conference on Pragmatism in the fall of the year 2000. This coincided, more or less, with the final issue of Assemblage, uh, and in this context we don't have to remind everyone that the subtitle of Assemblage was A Critical Journal of Architecture and Design and Culture, uh, where Bob Somel's, to my mind, rather definitive statement appeared in the final issue of that journal. It was also around this time that the more polemical articles of Michael Speaks first appeared in places like Architectural Record, although he'd been writing along similar lines for a number of years before that. Now, what all of this suggests to me is that, first of all, the issues and the personalities have changed little over the past 15 years, and I think they're unlikely to change at this late date, which leads me to think that what we are dealing with here is less a class of ideas than a difference in style, sensibility, and ambition. That is to say, different research projects, even different life projects, which would happily coexist. If critical discourse thrives anywhere today, it is in the academy. An intellectual investment in critical theory may, as Dave Hickey has suggested, get you tenure in a place where it snows, but what it won't get you is credibility in the world outside the academy. If architects are to become public intellectuals, we need a project that is believable and realistic. So, having signaled my weariness with the debate, I do want to jump in, perhaps against my better judgment, and address two specific points. The first is a bit of cherry picking among the varieties of critical practice. Both Baird and Martin indulged this, narrowly defining the critical in order to underscore an equally narrow scope for the post-critical. Clearly, the prefix post marks a dependency in the term that follows, and it's for this reason that nobody who works under the broad umbrella of projective practices specifically identifies themselves as post-critical. It seems useful to me to try and identify what I see as four overlapping but distinct critical positions uh, all of which emerged over the course of the 1980s, I believe. The first is Tafurian strategies of resistance and refusal, most convincingly argued by Michael Hayes in his 1986 Perspecta article entitled Critical Architecture Between Culture and Form, a kind of founding document for critical theory in architecture. Developed in the wake of historicist postmodernism, this essay suggested that by refusing the easily commodified image, or the comfort of formal incident, a stripped down, silent architecture with Otto Bloss or Mies van der Rohe as its modernist precursors could resist becoming yet another consumable image. This theoretical argument, of course, had its counterpart in architectural projects by architects such as Herzog de Meron or Diener and Diener at roughly the same time. Now, around this same time as well, in parallel to Hayes' theoretical arguments, a series of architectural practices indebted to the critical art practices of the 70s and the 80s appeared. Borrowing rhetorical strategies from art criticism and exhibition strategies from conceptual art, these architects staged narratives of gender, media, the body, and identity politics through published projects, gallery installations, and public venues. This work was also characterized by its distrust of formal elaboration, preferring instead to foreground legibility and discursive content. Diller's video remained the most convincing example of this direction. Thirdly, although Eisenman identifies criticality quite early as a marker of advanced work in architecture, it was also in the 1980s that an argument around critique, disjunction, and fragmentation coalesced around the project of deconstructivism. The claim here is for a variety of Brechtian defamiliarization. That is to say, a formal language of deformations from known form 
triggers a process of critical reading that underscores the fundamentally arbitrary nature of form making in the first place and thereby calls into question architecture's traditional associations with stability and foundation of thinking. Shumi or Liebeskin could each in different ways be understood to employ similar strategies of defamiliarization. Finally, it is important to recall that Kenneth Frampton was early and consistently identified with the critical. His seminal book, Modern Architecture, A Critical History, appeared in 1980, and his essay on critical regionalism was anthologized in Hal Foster's uh, collection, The Anti-Aesthetic, in 1983. Even last year, a conference in honor of Frampton was, at his request, entitled Global versus Local, Critical Sustainability in Architecture and Urban Form. So the critical persists, and it persists in many different forms. That some of these critical positions are antithetical one another, to one another is obvious. Hayes and Frampton share some territory, and both are skeptical about the project of architecture as language. But Hayes has also written sympathetically about Eisenman and Diller's Scofidio. Shumi and Eisenman both deploy strategies of disjunction in service of critical project, but they see the role of form as entirely distinct. In short, the critical never constituted, co constituted a coherent block, and what is now identified as post-critical did not emerge simply as a re reaction to a single father figure, but rather parallel to the critical as one of many competing theoretical or practical alternatives. Unpack the edible narrative, and what emerges is a sense of the projective, not as a swerve away from once dominant critical practices, but rather a complex genealogy of affirmative creative practices that exhibit a similar variety. Which brings me, me to my second point. There is a rather persistent rhetorical strategy that wants to see any call for projective practice as simply an apology for conventional professional practice, just giving in to prevailing market forces. And there's a not so subtle implication that anyone advocating projective practice is anti-theory or anti-intellectual. Now, I think there are two points to be argued here. Uh, the first has to do with process. Most would agree with Edward Said's assertion that critique is nothing more than a relentless search for alternatives. The problem with so much critical work today is that it stops at negative critique and never moves on to imagine alternatives. Sharp, skeptical analysis of existing reality is a necessary first step in any engaged work of architecture or urbanism, but it can't be an end in itself. Paraphrasing Paul de Man, we might say that critique is a passage you have to walk through, but it teaches you nothing about the art of walking. The second point is the need to understand practice in a broad social context. Surely some of the most important contemporary work is in the rethinking of practice itself. And this requires active engagement in workflows, markets, and politics, both global and local. But we also need to trust in the intelligence of the public and to be able to deploy what Antonio Negri and Michael Hart have called the genius of collective practice, or what Michel de Certeau has described as the anonymous creativity of everyday life. This brings me to my final point. I don't see how it's possible to decouple the critical from an idea of architecture as a discursive medium. In the broadest sense, in order to be effective, critique requires legibility. Now, Architecture's representational function will never entirely go away, and it remains an aspect of architectural design that needs to be actively considered by anyone working today. However, it seems to me that some 35 years into the semiotic project, I think it's legitimate to ask if the semiotic function of architecture is its primary uh, active variable that can be productively deployed as part of productive practice today. I've written pretty extensively about the need to maintain this distinction between uh, material and discursive practices, uh, about the different potentials of writing and design uh, as parallel practices, and I don't want to restate those arguments here. Instead, I'd like to end by uh, quoting another colleague who, in a different way, calls for a similar distinction between writing and designing. Quoting here 
I don't think that contemporary writing has any right to specify anything about the current operations of practice. Indeed, the problem is a practical one in the end. On the one hand, it's a strategic problem for theorists to decide which parts of the discourse can be usefully opened up for interrogation by current conceptual technologies. And on the other hand, it's a different pro problem for architects to decide which parts of the built environment can be opened up with current design technologies. The difference between writers and architects is simply a technological one. They share a lot of technologies, but some of those technologies and some of the levels of expertise at using them are significantly and fortunately different. Now, for those who don't recognize the voice or the rhetorical strategies, I won't pull off the suspense. That's Mark Wigley, and uh, that's from the publication documenting the first assemblage conference in 1994. And for the moment, I'm happy to give him the last word.